Good morning. And thanks for joining us so early this morning. Hopefully you've had your coffee. Welcome to the Securities and Exchange Commission's 2024 National Compliance Outreach Seminar for Investment Advisors and Investment Company Compliance Professionals. Today's event is sponsored by the SEC's Division of Examinations, Division of Enforcement, as well as the Division of Investment Management. I am Vanessa Horton, an IAIC National Associate in the Division of Examinations. Together with Marshall Gandhi, we are serving as the chairpersons for this event. We will introduce each of the presentations today. But before we begin, I'd like to remind you to visit www.sec.gov under the Rules Enforcement and Compliance dropdown, where there is a link to the Compliance Outreach Program with the following information. You can access today's agenda for today. And as you can see, we have a very full agenda planned for you. You can also submit any questions for the panelists. There are links within each agenda under each panel to submit questions, or you can also email them to compliance outreach at sec.gov. We appreciate the many questions we've already received in advance of today. You can also review the biographies of our esteemed panelists to learn more about their knowledge and their experience. So to kick off the seminar today, we have first a message from the SEC chair, Chair Gensler. Gary Gensler was nominated by President Biden to serve as the chair of the SEC. He was sworn into office on April 17, 2021. Before joining the SEC, Chair Gensler was professor of the practice of global economics and management at the MIT Sloan School of Management, co-director of MIT's FinTech at CSAIL, and senior advisor to the MIT's Media Lab Digital Currency Initiative. He also previously served as the, as the chair of the Maryland Financial Consumer Protection Commission. He was also formerly chair of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, was senior advisor to U.S. Senator Paul Sarbanes in writing the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and was undersecretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance and Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Prior to his public service, Chair Gensler also served, worked at Goldman Sachs. So let's hear from our chair today. To the 2024 National Compliance Outreach Seminar, I wanna thank all of you, the thousands of compliance experts from investment companies, investment advisors across this great land for joining us today. You know, compliance uh, at its core is more than just about making sure that your employers, your clients, your companies are following the rules laid out by Congress and laid out by the SEC and other financial regulators. It's at its core, it's about ensuring that markets work for investors and issuers alike. It's a big reason why I think that we here in America have the deepest, most liquid capital markets in the world. And speaking of compliance, uh, I do wanna say that my views that I express here today are my own. And although I'm speaking in my official capacity, my remarks do not necessarily reflect the views of the five member commission uh, or my other commissioners or members of the staff. You see, even I have to, ensure for certain compliance. And, and, and it's not just solely about ensuring that your companies, your clients, your employers don't defraud the public. That's really important. That's really important. But it's also following the rules with regard to their registration, uh, ensuring that they uh, put their interest of their customers ahead of the investment advisors, time-tested ideas and concepts around fiduciary duty, and many of the various intimate, integral pieces of the securities laws with regard to registration. And it basically builds trust in our system. Now, 
we recognized this long ago, Congress recognized this long ago, and we set up different ways to inspect our registrants, whether it was registered broker dealers, registered stock exchanges, regular registered investment advisors and investment companies, and to inspect them or examine them against the rules and the laws. Because of course, the rules and the laws mean something, but they really mean a lot more if you inspect upon them. And nearly 30 years ago, we also set up within the SEC, the predecessors of our current division of examinations. It's grown into about a quarter of our workforce, uh, conducts about 3,200 examinations a year. And uh, through those examinations, not only do we learn but I think many of the registrants and the companies that you represent and the advisors you represent gain a great deal. So it's not just about inspecting the firms, but it's that exchange of information. We get to keep our fingers closer to the pulse of what's happening. Technology is changing so rapidly. Business models are changing so rapidly. But you also get to ask questions of our talented staff. And I think that that's really uh, an important piece of all this. Um, so I just want to thank you once again for coming together. I know that um, I think it's been 20 years now since the anniversary, since we put in place the compliance rule. And, and part of that rule also had to do with in registered investment advisors and investment companies to appoint chief compliance officers, those that fulfill that role. I I think it's an important role. I applaud you for doing that. And I hope that you all have a terrific conference. It's a great opportunity for staff and everyone from industry to uh, share views and learn from each other. With that, I hand it back. Thank you, Chair Gensler. Uh, good morning. I'm Marshall Gandy and along with Vanessa Horton, we have the privilege of directing the National IAIC Examination Program, the largest program in the Division of Examination, which is comprised of over 650 managers, attorneys, accountants, examiners, and support staff, and includes examination oversight of almost 16,000 registered investment advisors and 800 registered fund complexes representing over $130 trillion in assets under management. The SEC's Division of Examination, Division of Investment Management, and the Asset Management Unit of the Division of Enforcement jointly sponsor this compliance outreach program, which seeks to promote open communication, facilitate empowerment, and enhance coordination with the SEC and the financial services industry on mutual fund, investment advisor, and broker-dealer compliance issues. There are so many to thank for helping us put on this conference this morning, notably the SEC AV team for making the miracle of technology work. We also want to thank all of the moderators and panelists for their hard work in preparing and presenting their panels. And Vanessa and I want to thank our National Examination Program Office team supervised by Mavis Kelly, including Karen, Steven Karen Stevenson, Leslie Ward, Keith Canyon, Carolyn O'Brien, and Lindsay Tabalas for planning and organizing today's National Outreach Conference. A special thanks has to go to NEPO team member Lucas Tepper, without whose tireless efforts during the last several months, this program would absolutely not be possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce Keith Cassidy, the acting director of the Division of Examinations. Keith joined the SEC nearly 15 years ago, and much of his service has been in the Division of Examinations, not only in his current role as the division's acting director, but also as the division's deputy director, national associate, national associate director of technology controls uh, program. He has also served as the director of the SEC's Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. And prior to his time with the SEC, Keith worked for the Department of Justice and the US Senate. In his other life, in April of this year, Keith was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and assumed the command 
of the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve 4th Reconnaissance Battalion. Among his other accolades, Keith is a recipient of the Bronze Star Medal. Keith, I will now turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Marshall, and good morning. I'm very pleased to be here today to open the 2024 National Compliance Outreach Seminar and have the opportunity to talk about the importance of compliance with so many dedicated financial services compliance professionals, experts, and colleagues from across the commission. Each of you are committed to the long-term success of strengthening compliance and protecting investors. Thank you for joining us in today's discussions designed to improve compliance by strengthening the lines of communication between the SEC and compliance professionals. We face several years marked by a great deal of tumult and change where our markets and investors have faced a pandemic, geopolitical instability, inflation, and widespread cyber threats, as well as the opportunities and challenges presented by a more diffuse workforce, making discussions such as the one today all the more important. My comments today will discuss how we in the SEC's Division of Examinations are furthering the division's mission to strengthen compliance and investor protection, as well as improving our communication with registrants to help promote a sound culture of compliance at your firms. Before I begin my remarks, however, I need to share a blanket disclaimer for all the commission staff today that the views the staff expresses today will be made in their official capacities, but do not necessarily reflect the views of the commission, the commissioners, or other members of the staff. The Division of Examination supports the SEC's tripartite mission to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. We oftentimes speak of the division's mission through the lens of what we refer to as our four pillars, which emphasizes our work to promote compliance, prevent fraud, monitor risk, and inform policy. Exams has a unique mission and role at the commission. We're responsible for conducting examinations of financial entities that are required by law to register with the commission. The registrants include a truly diverse set of financial market participants, including investment advisors, investment companies, broker dealers, exchanges, FINRA, the MSRB, transfer agents, and clearing agencies, among others. We cover a very broad waterfront. In today's market environment, not only are we conducting examinations in traditional areas, but we're also examining for compliance with newly effective rules, looking ahead to changes in technology, dealing with some of the same cyber issues that each of you face every day, and considering the implications of recent advances in crypto assets and artificial intelligence, among others. In March, we'll mark our division's 30th anniversary, and as we approach this milestone, it's helpful to spend a moment reflecting on how far we've come. There have been immense changes since we were formed in 1995, then known as the Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations. Just in the past several years, we've seen a tremendous change in how both clients and professionals interact. The pandemic accelerated a shift from offices towards a more mobile, distributed business model. Clients meet virtually with their investment professionals from the convenience of their own homes and make investments in our capital markets from their computer, tablet, or smartphone. Consumers now have access to smart portfolios with dynamic rebalancing and fully automated algorithmic trading. And while those innovations are both transforming and democratizing finance, making it more affordable and accessible than ever before, they also pose challenges as we all strive to ensure robust compliance and investor protection. When compared to the industry we examine, we are a fraction of the vast landscape and must leverage all tools at our disposal including technology and communications to increase efficiency and effectiveness and ensure the finance, that industry professionals, such as all of you here today, are empowered to, be, to help provide the protection that investors rely and depend upon. My message to you today is that opportunities like we have at this seminar and at similar outreach events across the country throughout the year where we can discuss compliance issues in a practical way are both important and mutually beneficial. Together, we can share our experiences and promote effective compliance practices so that you, like us, remain effective in your mission. Our examinations coupled with your effective compliance programs are essential elements of our collective shared interest in investor protection and preserving market integrity. I think it is worth taking a moment to emphasize how essential all of your compliance efforts are to protecting investors. We cannot be everywhere all at once. Strong investor protection requires empowered compliance professionals and strong cultures of compliance within firms. 
promoting compliance is in our DNA. Not only is it one of our four pillars at, within the division, it is an important focus of our work. We recognize that a vital component of our mission is promoting and supporting compliance functions at our regulated entities. Our examinations go hand in hand with your robust compliance programs. Given our size relative to the markets we examine, effective industry compliance is essential to protecting investors and our work to promote and strengthen those compliance efforts is critical. One of the ways that we promote and strengthen compliance is through our communications. Starting last year, we shifted the publication of our annual examination priorities uh, to earlier than ever before. By announcing our priorities earlier, we are more closely aligned with the fiscal year, which drives our work, transparency, and messaging. Publishing our priorities earlier also allows us to reach CCOs and compliance professionals prior to the calendar year end, which we know affects internal planning and budgeting discussions at many registrants. A lot of time and effort goes into the creation of our annual priorities document, which we published two weeks ago. I encourage you to read the fiscal year 25 priorities thoroughly and to carefully consider them in relation to your planning and the tailoring of your compliance program to your business and risks. There's another important communication channel that I also wanted to highlight. The division is active in publishing risk alerts. Since 2011, we have periodically issued risk alerts. Many of you will already be familiar with these, I'm sure, now totaling over 70 separate publications covering a wide array of topics across our program areas. Our risk alerts raise awareness of compliance and industry risks and are meant to encourage firms to think about their own policies and procedures in particular areas. By communicating about risks, we observe during examinations in a synthesized and anonymized form our risk alerts allow us to share key observations outside of the context of an examination so that firms can proactively assess whether they need to strengthen their compliance programs. We also actively seek opportunities for outreach to communicate and engage with investors, registrants, and compliance professionals to raise awareness and promote compliance through participation in regional and national seminars, workshops, conferences, and events like today. By communicating our annual priorities, periodic risk alerts, and at outreach events across the country, we aim to create a roadmap for strengthening compliance and investor protection and seek to empower our compliance professionals to lead discussions about enhancing compliance within their firms. We are always pleased when we hear CCOs say that they are able to point to our communications during their internal discussions about budget and resource allocations because we share an interest in ensuring investor ben investors benefit from the robust compliance and protections. I want to recognize and thank all the CCOs and compliance professionals for joining us today and for your commitment and work to promote and strengthen compliance within your firms and across the industry. We share a common commitment to protecting our nation's savers and investors and look forward to our continued work to advance this mission together. I also want to acknowledge and thank Mavis Kelly and her team within the division's national exam program office. Without their work, today's compliance outreach seminar would not be possible. And to thank Susan Weiss and Kevin Stemp uh, in my office for their assistance in preparing today's remarks. I'm excited to get started. So without further ado, let me turn things uh, back over to our National Associate Director for the Investment Advisor and Investment Company Program, Vanessa Horton. Thanks so much, Keith. And thank you for those remarks regarding the Division of Examinations. I know I always appreciate, and hopefully everyone else does, hearing from you and hearing from the thoughts you're, you're sharing regarding the importance of promoting compliance and strengthening it in, uh, in amongst all of our registrar population. So thank you. Up next, we have representatives from each of the three divisions sponsoring the seminar today, Division of Examinations, Investment Management, and Enforcement. Examinations objective, as you've heard, is to improve industry practices and compliance, prevent fraud, monitor risk, and inform policy. Investment management is responsible for developing regulatory policy for investment companies and investment advisors. And enforcement oversees the SEC's civil law enforcement function by conducting investigations into possible securities law violations. The work performed by these three divisions is critical to the SEC's mission to protect investors, maintain fair and orderly and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. We've already introduced Keith, so now we'll have the pleasure to introduce our other panelists joining him today, Natasha Greiner and Sam Walden. Natasha is the Director of the Division of Investment Management. She began her SEC career in the Division of Examinations 
as a broker dealer examiner and has served in a variety of roles across the agency for more than 23 years, including acting chief counsel and assistant chief counsel in the division of trading and markets. Immediately before being named the director of investment management, Natasha served several senior leadership roles in the division of examinations, including deputy director, associate director of the home office IAIC examination program, and national associate director for the investment advisor investment company examination program, which includes the private funds unit. Sam Walden is the act acting deputy director and chief counsel in the division of enforcement. He joined the SEC as enforcement's chief counsel in March of 2022. And prior to joining the SEC, he was a partner at the law firm Pros Proskauer Rose LLP. He was also previously assistant chief counsel for the SEC's division of enforcement. And earlier in his career, he was a staff attorney in the SEC's division of enforcement. So with that introduction, I am looking forward to hearing the perspectives of these three senior leaders on a variety of topics. Turn it over to you. Thanks, Vanessa. And I just wanted to express how excited I am to be here with, with Sam and Natasha mm -hmm. today. Uh, it may not be you know, obvious to everybody, but we, we've known each other for quite a long time. And I think uh, even though we'll talk a little bit about the importance uh, of our various divisions and the independent mission that each of them form, uh, there is a lot of a collaboration that goes on that that may not be obvious to to, to everybody out there in industry. Uh, and as a little bit of background, I think it was alluded to, but between the three divisions that are represented here today, it's about a little bit north of 60% of the staff at the commission. And so I think hopefully that'll give you some scale to the uh, to to some of our responses uh, about the importance of that collaboration as we go through executing our independent missions. Uh, and maybe a, a little bit of a peek behind the curtain of how that happens um, you know, throughout the year. Um, so with that, we'll dive right in. And, and I think it was alluded to uh, in, in, the, uh, in the bio, but Nashi, Natasha, you've obviously been you know, in, in IM, uh, currently leading IM, you spent time in exams, you, you spent time in TM and enforcement. Um, what changes have you ever observed, uh, if at all, in the nature and level of the day-to-day -day collaboration over that time between the divisions, uh, particularly with respect to exams and enforcement? Uh, great question. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is one of my favorite events, uh, the division of exams, obviously, as a, a former national associate. Um, it's a great opportunity to kind of talk to a wide variety of CCOs and, and give insight and transparency into the division of uh, examinations, but also the agencies. Um, processes and how we, as you suggest, coll collaborate. And so, you know, I think it has evolved. I, I would say even, I was thinking about it uh, this morning, even like five to 10 years ago um, when I was in trading and markets, you know, I was working on role makings and I, I even, even in, when I worked in ex enforcement, you know, w what exams function was, was not as apparent to many of the staff. You know, whether it was an enforcement case, like I used to get many of my leads when enforcement from exams. Examiners are, are, are interacting with registrants on a daily basis and have such a phenomenal insight. The referrals that I would get from exams would literally have a red bow on them. And then moving to the policy side, we work on rulemakings I'd, and I'd see maybe even pre 30 day draft to the commission, I'd ask the question, has anyone talked to OC? You know, like consistently the answer would be now. And I'd be like, what are you, this is, we need to get their insight. They have the perspective from the industry. They are the ones that will be examining for this rule to the extent if adopted. And so I think that has changed dramatically. I think it's a lot of it is because many of us have kind of been at the commission for a while, understand the value of exams and, and the perspective that the examiners have. And so today, I think many divisions on the policy side work with, um, exams from the get-go, even pre-term sheet for purposes of rulemaking. But even, I know we'll talk about the rulemaking process a little bit later, but even beyond rulemaking, we talk to exam staff on a daily basis. It is, it's not just a project by project, it's we review um, filings, whether they're from registered investment companies or um, advisors, and then 
we and I am will then call and coordinate with exams to the extent that we think there might be anomalies or questions on outreach or potential exams. And then to the extent there's a true outlier and there's a concern, we might even reach out to enforcement. So the collaboration on a daily basis has increased exponentially. I think kudos to all um, uh, of the divisions. I think a lot of it does come from tone on the top, much like I think they'll hear as CCOs, like tone on the top is so important. It, that is important to us as well. And so I think each of the divisions over the last five, 10 years have really tried to advocate it more um, coordination because I think we are all better in our jobs from each other's perspectives and coordinating and not duplicating efforts, especially in, in times of limited resources, is, it creates efficiencies um, and makes us do our jobs even better. Absolutely, Could, couldn't agree more. And I guess, Sam, from your perspective, how does IM and exams contribute to the enforcement's mission? Yeah, and I'll start by also thanking you, Keith, for inviting me. Um, this is a great program. Um, you talked a little bit about the commission's mission, and that's also enforcement's mission, um, investor protection, integrity of the markets. Um, and in carrying out that mis mission, we work very closely with both um, IM and exams. In a number of different ways, I'll, I'll highlight three ways, primary ways I, I think about it. First, we, we recognize that, that your divisions are the subject matter experts here, um, both in terms of the law, um, how the Advisors Act works, how the 40 Act works, um, the rules um, promulgated underneath those uh, acts, um, but also how the industry works and um, you know what what is really going on in the real world we want to be you know focused on the real world as we're conducting investigations so that's number one number two um, you know we look at at both exams and I am as the eyes and ears of the commission and so the eyes and ears for us as well um, I think of I am maybe having more of a macro view of of the industry, um, probably uh, that view is influenced by exams, but um, look to I am for that. And then exams on a more micro level, really at a firm specific level as to what is going on and where, where there are problems. I mean, we've got limited resources and enforcement and we wanna use them smartly. Um, and so we wanna be looking um, in places where we think that there are likely to be problems. And then the final thing I would say is we view both of your divisions as the policy experts. Um, you know best what uh, policies are important to the commission, um, our client. And again, limited resources, want to use them smartly. We want to be looking at things that are important to our client. And you know, we see that in the priorities, the exam priorities, we see it in the rulemaking agenda, but we can actually talk to you guys and, and find out exactly what is important to our client, and then we can direct our resources that way. Absolutely, and I, I certainly see it from, from the exam's perspective, and I would agree, <laughs> Natasha, I think I've, I've seen the arc of collaboration just continuously improve. I know we meet as front offices, you know, so that setting that tone at the top. I know our chief, our various chief counsels are constantly, you know, coordinating and, and discussing, you know, novel issues. Uh, and, and even at the staff level, uh, you know, we each have independent missions. You know, I think some folks uh, have the misimpression that exams is just an, an arm of enforcement. But the reality is it's a very small number of our, the, the chair mentioned over 3000 exams a year actually result in referrals. And even that number of referrals it's a much smaller number that enforcement actually, you know, chooses to take uh, uh, fully uh, to the commission. Um, but it is it is critical in those instances where, you know, you either have significant fraud or you have a registrant that's not willing uh, to adjust their behavior to come into compliance. You know, enforcement is there uh, to, to ensure uh, that 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 those issues are addressed. And similarly, you know, we, we look to, to IM and TM and the other rulemaking divisions when there are novel uh, policy related issues. You know, we don't make policy in the division of exams. We inform policy and we can be those eyes and the ears. Uh, but to ensure, you know, consistency across, you know, the, the commission and the interactions, we really rely on those rulemaking um, divisions to provide that insight. And that's not that is both through a, a more formal process like a referral process. But I think I've also seen it absolutely day to day. 
um, where if there's any sort of questions, it's better to, to lay those flat across the commission and ensure that we're speaking with one voice to, uh, to registrants. Yeah, I think you made a really good point. Like we are all under the umbrella of the agency's mission. But we also have independent missions and we, are, we do actually work independent one, of, one another. A lot of decisions made by exams are independent and you might consult with us or get input. But ultimately, the priorities are the exam priorities. And, and just like for the rulemaking side, our rulemaking initiatives, you know, we consult and get input from both other divisions. But ultimately, our recommendations are IM recommendations with consultation with the other divisions. So I think that's really important because I think we talk about collaboration and sometimes people view that we're just we're one and the same. And But we do really work independent one, of one another um, in support of our own particular missions. So I know we you talked a lot in um, your your comments today about um, you know one of your priorities is increasing transparency and communication with registrants and then you know kudos first of all I know I've I've left the exams but I know uh, Keith committed when I left that they were going to publish priorities again in October so congratulations on getting that out but priorities and risk alerts are such a huge um, an important way to talk to um, compliance officers outside of an exam many many registrants never get examined over a course of a number of years, but you're, you really do share the benefit of that insight through priorities as what your risk or areas of um, concerns are or areas of focus are for priorities, but also risk alerts and sharing observations. So can you explain how that works a little bit and whether or not it's changed since I've left? I know I've been gone nine months now, so uh, curious if anything has changed. And, and some of it just could be evolution of, of the market as well and, and uh, trends that have been um, evolving over the, over the course of the years. Absolutely, yeah. and I think I promised to peek behind the curtain, but Natasha was a critical part of, of adjusting the timing of, of uh, the priorities earlier in the year when she was uh, uh, in exams. Um, so things haven't changed substantially in the last nine months, but folks may not realize it's a nine or 10 month long process um, that we, we now initiate in the, in the late part of the winter uh, of gathering information both from our examiners, from leaders within exams, uh, but also across the commission, you know, all the divisions and, and, uh, and offices, uh, but then also going out to external stakeholders, which uh, in, the, in the vein of transparency, reaching out to both industry groups uh, as, as well as investor groups to get their perspectives. Uh, and that process goes on for many months, uh, receiving input both from uh, the commissioners and the, and the chair uh, and results in that document, uh, which, uh, to your point, you, you made it very well. You know, we do 3,000 uh, exams a year, roughly, but there's so many more registrants that might benefit from those observations and also benefit uh, to be prepared when our examiners, should they show up, to, to understand uh, what we might be looking at. Um, and, and similarly, in that vein, you know, the, the risk alerts, um, they're more episodic when we when we identify uh, issues or observations in uh, in, in exams, uh, and we feel that it would be beneficial to registrants to communicate that. But it's similarly uh, a very collaborative process where it's it's formed from observations, typically from from exams, but is informed with uh, coordination, primarily with the rulemaking divisions, um, to ensure that consistent messaging. Uh, and again, the more that we can, you know, set that tone and uh, telegraph what it, or what the expectations are, I think it benefits uh, everyone. And I think I've, I've certainly seen in both of those, uh, we continue to evolve and improve the process, uh, and we'll continue to do so because I think there's just so much value there. Yeah, I see. I see it now from the other side, from a policy uh, division, and kind of how we provide input to all those um, very important documents, whether it's priorities or risk alerts, and, and a lot of that really happens at the inception, whether you're brainstorming priorities from a national program, um, we provide a lot of input or um, risk alerts. So not only are we reviewing and providing um, uh, our perspective on um, potential drafts of risk alerts, but we're talking before um, just about ideas of where we think exams might want to look at particular areas a focus and then be able to share observations because exams is such a unique position that you are able to share observations um, with the industry in a way that's very unique from uh, enforcement or a policy division like I am. And so uh, we really, we, I mean, if I've continued to support in my new role, but I know that um, the staff within the division has always supported um, those, those type of, that type of transparency in the way. And, and I know that exams has increased that over the last year or two, and I think it's really been beneficial. I hear, as I'm talking to 
um, CCOs as, as I go to different events that the value of not only changing the timing of priorities, but also the content of what's in the risk alerts and how helpful it is and, and useful to promote as a CCO to and advocate changes within their, um, their firm um, based on what the commission is saying, saying, hey, we could get this exam, but look, there's this risk alert, we should really make some changes. And it's always helpful to advocate um, the CCO's positions when there's a tension between business lines and, and the CCO perspective. So I think uh, folks would be interested to hear from the policy division's perspective, uh, the rulemaking process and co post-compliance state uh, efforts. You know, we kind of talked about the, the other side, the, the exam side of it. And I think you alluded earlier about the integration of various perspectives, even in the independent rulemaking process. Yeah, so um, just kind of more holistically or taking a step back, you know, rulemaking is much like uh, many things in this building, an iterative process. It takes time through proposal and adoption. Um, uh, a lot of our rulemaking is um, based on the chair's kind of policy agenda, but also a lot of the po policy initiatives are also prompted by the staff themselves, um, or even really from discussions with enforcement also uh, and exams, because, you know, sometimes there are, you know, even there are new initiatives for potential new rules, but there's a lot of uh, insight that uh, exams and enforcement provides us on what's already like already in the in the 40 Act or the Advisors Act, what's working and what's not based on examinations or enforcement or just evolution of the market and the industry. Um, so we get a lot of feedback on various rulemaking initiatives from a lot of different touch points within the agency, including both divisions. But that rulemaking process, and I, like I alluded to before, you know, we kind of come up with an idea and we work on term sheets, we consult uh, all the relevant stakeholders within the agency, and that process is very iterative, so drafts and um, consultations with our general counsel's office and both divisions, getting a lot of input. And you know, from my perspective in my new role, I think it's really important to get enforcement and exams perspective on rulemaking initiatives because you know, we can kind of propose a rule and adopt a rule with the obviously the majority approval of the commission, but if, if exams can't examine for that rule or enforcement can't enforce the rule, then we've just got it wrong. Um, and it also is that means it's probably difficult for many CCOs to actually implement um, at th that, you know, that rule within their own compliance program. And so really wanted to think kind of what the impact is, not only for the industry, but also the agency um, to make sure that we're giving everyone the right tools uh, to, you know, examine for compliance or enforce at some later date. And, you know, one of the things that I think has really evolved over the years is, you know, post-adoption, once we're getting revving up to the compliance state of a particular rule and then post-compliance state, the coordination that happens with particularly exams, but also at some point enforcement later down the road. But, you know, there's a gearing up. I talk about this a lot. The industry gears up for a compliance state. They're doing a lot of work. They're thinking about their compliance program, what changes they need to make, do they, what supervisory structure do they need to put in place. Well, we in the agency do the same. Exams does the same in order to get up to speed. They're, we're doing trainings and exams, and, and IM takes a particularly important key role in that because we're the ones that have, are the expert on a particular rule. So we want to share that experience with exams because they're the ones ultimately examining for that. So, you know, we help with toolkits or modules that exams utilizes for purposes of examining for compliance with a particular rule. But then even post, you know, compliance state, we continue to be a resource to exams. Um, and it really played out, I think, one of the best examples, and maybe one we may not be able to replicate in the future, was the significant coordination that both exams and I am um, participated in before and after the marketing rule compliance state, it was a big rule. Some parts very simple, some parts very complex. And so the training between the two divisions, um, I am really playing a key role in that. But also once um, exams started examining for compliance with the marketing rule, there was almost a year plus where um, I am, and, and when I was in exams really promoted this because deficiency letters that are issued on a new rule are providing insight to the industry as how the rules should be implemented and the policy kind of 
perspectives of how one should comply with that rule, especially where they're in areas of there's gray. And so it was important to me when I was at exams and now I continue to really value of like the deficiency letters that exams issues are critical. And so to the extent that we can help and in the marketing role, we looked along with exams at every deficiency letter for almost a year that was issued by um, exams, whether you were in Denver or New York, um, you know, I think they were reviewed for purposes of, are we sending the same message? So that all, you know, CC and Devendra or New York or Miami would all have the same insight from that particular deficiency letter. And again, it may not be a model we'll be able to do every time, but I think it is critical when a rule like the marketing rule is so impactful and it really touches upon every advisor. Um, because they will, they will all have to think about complying with this rule. And so it's, it's that type of coordination, really from the term sheet to post-implementation that I think is really important and has increased over the years. Um, and I, you know, I think really would like to continue doing that um, in the coming years. There's a lot of rules that have been adopted. And so you know, we, we talk a year in advance. Uh, we're talking today about you know, what's, coming, you know, what's coming down the road. Um, and how can we prepare as an agency for exams enforcement um, for for thinking about these new rule sets? But how can we, as I am, provide value to the two divisions so that they can be prepared as well? Yeah, I think that's well said, and not something that I necessarily appreciated until I stepped into a, a more national role within the division. You know, we really have to be intentional about it and uh, ensure that you know across, as, as Marshall said, the more than six thousand six hundred. Uh, IAC examiners that you know they're getting consistent. You're getting a consistent interaction. Uh, Sam, I think folks would love to, to understand some of the interaction or potential interactions between the policy divisions and exams in, in the course of an enforcement matter. Yeah, and so every investigation is different. Um, so this does not apply across the board. But in most cases, um, and if it's work, if it's the process is working the way it should work. Break it down into three parts. First, the beginning of the investigation, or even before the investigation uh, begins. So, to go back to what I was saying before, um, we should be looking to both divisions as the subject matter experts on the law and on how the industry works, so that we're thinking about our investigation right out of the gate the right way. Um, and I will make a, a shout out to our asset management unit. A lot of the coordination that takes place in, in this industry, in these types of cases, is through, not always, but often through our, our asset management unit. Um, really, they've done a great job um, breaking down the silos. You were talking about that earlier, Natasha. Um, so at the beginning, um, relying on subject matter expertise, um, also relying on eyes and ears of the commission, making sure that we're we're looking in the right place, uh, that we're identifying issues out of the gate where we think that there's potential noncompliance and directing our resources there. Uh, and then also the policy experts and making sure that, that what we're looking at is what the commission wants us to be looking at. And so that's the beginning. Then in the middle of the investigation, what should happen, um, you know, you start an investigation, you think, this is what we're likely to find. This is the issue we're trying to address. This is how the law works. And then you go out and sometimes that's the case, but often life is more complicated. The facts are a little bit different than you thought. You start taking testimony, you get documents. Um, the facts look a little bit different. Uh, you start talking to opposing counsel. They take a maybe a different view of the law um, given the different facts. And so we should be throughout the investigation consulting with folks in, in exams, in IM, you know, okay, the facts are now looking like this. Um, is it still your view that this is a case that we should be looking at? Um, the law, we're hearing arguments that it's actually a little bit different than we thought. What do you, what do you think about those arguments? Are they, are they arguments that present lit risk for us? Or is it, you know, we've thought about that and that's not the way to think about the, the rule or the, the statute? Uh, and so that's the middle. And then at the end of the investigation, when it's time for us to make a recommendation, either to settle an action or to litigate, um, we have a very, very robust uh, internal review process. In enforcement, we'll put together a memo that will document in 
sometimes excruciating detail, the facts that we have found, um, how we think about the law and how it applies to those facts, the, um, the charges we recommend bringing, the remedies we're recommending that the commission seek. And before that goes to the commission, it will go to both, if, it's, if we're talking about an, you know, an investment advisor or a, you know, a registered fund, that, will, you know, that recommendation will go to both of your divisions. Uh, there will often be multiple rounds of comments and review, and you'll be able, it's our recommendation, but you'll have a very big role in what that recommendation looks like and how it is presented up to the commission. And then after it goes through all of that, it goes to the commission and it is not at all uncommon for commissioners. They'll, they'll have questions for us, they'll have questions for our Office of General Counsel, but if we're talking about you know, an asset manager, they're, they're probably gonna have questions for exams or, or I am. So it is a, you know, again, it's, it's our recommendation. They're, you know, they're, you know, we have distinct, um, you know, distinct missions but we do rely heavily on, on both of your divisions in coming up with the recommendation. And, and I think in most cases, you know, you'll have a, you know, an opportunity to, to really shape what the recommendation looks like. One of the things that I think, um, if, you, if I think about the, my span of my career here of what's, been, what's different in enforcement and exams and IM, which is, is the tools that we have, the, the, the data, but also the analytics that we have and how we kind of share that information amongst one another for purposes of our own mission oriented work. You know, whether, you know, whether it's an exams, you know, thinking about looking at a particular issue and they see some like very you know, strong anomalies and outliers that they think are more appropriate for enforcement versus uh, exams or whether it's uh, IM's perspective of like reviewing filings and, and, you know, seeing, seeing things, whether it's form PF current reports where we want to, all that is now coordinated in a way that I think is, is really different and shared amongst the three divisions um, that is very unique. I know even in enforcement, the analytics and, and data-driven analytics has exponentially changed over the years since, since I left. And so that is also helpful for kind of the inception of the ideas, whether it's like an exam initiative or an enforcement investigation to kind of help us all. And it really also informs our rulemaking. We now use some of that data and analytics, you know, for, for a basis of potential rulemaking initiative. So uh, it's kind of, it's very impressive. I mean, we're never going to be as good as the industry and all the great resources and data that they have from an analytics perspective. But I think we've really, uh, we've evolved significantly over the years. And I think continue to, and I think you, you brought up a great thing that I wanted to highlight in that in exams, we do what we call thematic initiatives, which are separate and independent from sometimes enforcement will do initiatives. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about how enforcement comes up with initiatives or how that's formed? Sure. Um, and again, not all initiatives are the same and, and they can come up in different ways. But, but again, in, in the context of collaboration, I'll, I'll point to the marketing rule uh, as a great example. Uh, new rule or amendment to an existing rule that has some new, really important components I am promulgates, helps promulgate the rule. Um, exams goes out, starts looking and identifies issues. For us, initiatives are, are most effective when we're talking about what we think are potential instances of widespread noncompliance. Exams looks at the implementation of the marketing rule, identifies some areas where it looks like firms are, are really, uh, you know, in a large swath, not getting it right. Um, you know, the, the ability to include hypothetical performance in your marketing materials, great, but you also have to have compliance policies and procedures that are specific to that. Firms are missing that. Working together, come up with an initiative, and the end result is a, a number of cases that we brought. Um, and again, for us, it's, it, initiatives are really effective. It's, it's helpful when we bring a single case against a single registrant. But if we bring a case against, or several cases against a, a number of registrants, that gets way more attention. And so um, again, there, are, you know, initiatives come different ways, um, but that is a common, common way that we, we develop a, an initiative with, with your help. 
there's a lot of dialogue between the three divisions, whether it's an exam initiative or an enforcement um, initiative as to whether or not to, whether it's, it's an appropriate time or maybe exams goes in and the, and the feedback that would go, maybe it doesn't result in enforcement referrals, but comes back to like a policy division like I am where we then say, well, maybe, maybe there's just a misunderstanding of what the rule mm -hmm. actually means. And maybe there's ways that, that we could provide additional guidance. And so it doesn't always end up in enforcement or, you know, and I think there's many conversations I've had, whether in my exams role or in my IM position, where I've said to enforcement, it's just not right. You need to give the industry some time to comply and let's let exams kind of do their thing yeah. so that we can, that it can inform us whether or not we need to provide additional guidance. And, you know, I mean, in some cases, maybe, I don't, I don't know, I would say that for the market rule, but in some cases, for some rules, maybe even a relook at the rule just to see how we can, you know, maybe, you know, make certain fixes to it to provide more clarity, whether it's through rulemaking or through guidance um, or speaking events. You know, sometimes we aren't able to do additional FAQs or guidance, but we try to get the word out to um, the, you know, the compliance community of, of, of our perspective on what a new rule or um, a particular rule does, in, you know, what it actually means and what our expectation would be for compliance. That's a great segue because I think your answer to that question uh, uh, alludes to, you know, how you leverage your experience having been in rule, a different rulemaking division in exams, in enforcement. How do you bring that to bear as the director of, of IAM? Yeah, I get this question a lot. Ironically, um, when I when I got first announced as director, the biggest fear of the industry was that I had enforcement experience. <laughs> um, but I think both the enforcement the exams and actually the trading markets, you know, rulemaking, but also trading and market experience just generally has given me kind of like a, a unique experience in my role to kind of think about how we do things in IM and how best to, to, to collaborate or coordinate with other divisions. But, you know, even when you think about a particular rulemaking, you know, I do think about the practical implications of a particular rule and whether or not exams could comply, uh, uh, examine for compliance, whether enforcement can, but also whether or not it's, you know, good for the industry. Can they, is there, are there practical hurdles uh, that would prevent uh, compliance for a particular rule? And so I, I think, in, and I think just, I know coordination and collaboration was the theme of our panel. And I think, you know, me being in this role, I think my role, uh, and my perspective hopefully increases that collaboration and coordination. I mean, I talk to both of you quite often. And so I think that just, again, sets the tone on the top to ensure that the coordination continues so that um, we are sharing perspectives uh, in, you know, amongst ourselves so that it's providing input into all the things that we do on a daily basis. Yeah, I think that's very well said. And it was alluded, in Sam, in, uh, in your bio, you've, you've had spent time in private practice as well. So I'm curious how you leverage that in your current position. Yeah, so I, I started my career at Baker Botts, and there I got to work with Jim Doty, who um, had been the general counsel of the SEC. And from Jim, I, I learned um, a lot about the federal securities laws. He had a mystical understanding of them, at least it felt that way at the time, and also learned a lot about just being an attorney and a counselor from him. At Proskauer, um, they have a very large private funds practice. Um, at the time, a not in substantial registered funds practice. I worked a lot with those clients um, and so gained an understanding of the industry, uh, an understanding of how compliance fits within those firms, big and small, I know how hard that job is. I have a real appreciation of, of that. Um, and then also got to work with Bob Plays for a great deal of time, who is a longtime deputy director in an IM. And so he did not write the book, but he wrote the outline of the Advisors Act. So learned a lot from him as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and I know uh, it was alluded to earlier. I spent uh, early part of my time at the commission in a different role. And I think for me, uh, in that role, I got to work with basically every division and office and could kind of understand a lot of what we talked about as far as the independence of each of the divisions and offices, but the importance of that collaboration and leveraging, um, you know, the subject matter expertise across the division, uh, across the divisions uh, within the commission. Um, so I think hopefully folks have, have heard uh, the, the message that I'm trying to deliver about the importance of compliance and working with uh, the compliance professionals that have joined us today. Uh, but I wanted to give uh, each of you an opportunity for any, any final thoughts or any messages you might want to convey. 
they just start with the township. You no, know, I mean, I, I think that your opening remarks today uh, really set the tone for compliance officers. I mean, from my perspective, um, compli being a compliance officer is not an easy job. Um, not only are we constantly changing the landscape from a regulatory perspective, but as is the market evolving, technology is booming. Um, all of these things make compliance officers have to rethink their compliance program. And, and you know, I think we talk even in exams from our perspective, like I've said it for years, you need to be able to adapt and pivot um, and really kind of think about on a, a continuing basis of how you're going to tailor your compliance program to the new, the, you know, the new, the new rules from whether regulatory landscape changes, uh, whether technology changes, all these things are so important. And so I just want to acknowledge it's not an, it's not an easy job, but I think, you know, uh, conferences like this where we try to provide additional um, transparency, but also have very candid conversations about particular aspects of the asset ministry industry and pain points um, and share observations and experiences are, are so critical um, and, and really strong, strongly advocate and support for this conference and many others that the uh, Division of Examination holds, but also that the compliance community holds you know, without us in the room. I think those conversations are probably even more valuable to share amongst yourselves. I think no CCO is on an island, and so sharing perspectives among CCOs is also very helpful. So, Absolutely. Sam? Yeah, so we... We try and accomplish a lot through our enforcement actions, but one thing that in this space that, that is really important to us is the, the ability for us to empower CCOs. Um, you know, no one wants to be on the receiving end of an enforcement action, but, but one possible, you know, hopeful, hopefully good benefit is that if you are a CCO and you've been telling business people for years that this is a problem, you know, it's one thing to be able to say, we've got a deficiency notice on that. It's another thing, I think, to be able to say, look, this other firm just got sued on exactly the same conduct. And we really do. These, these policies and procedures that, you know, I know you think are a headache, they really are important. Um, and we really do need to comply with them. So that is, again, one of many um, you know, purposes behind our, our enforcement action. But it's an important one for us uh, in this space. Absolutely. Well. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Natasha, for joining us. Uh, I know Thank I you. found the, the dialogue very helpful. I hope others did as well. Uh, and with that, we'll turn it back to Marshall. Thank you so much, Natasha and Sam and Keith. Um, we, uh, we still count Natasha as one of our own in exams. Um, Sam, we won't hold it against you one of these days. Uh, maybe you can add uh, service to the division of exams. Uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, next on our agenda is our first uh, informational panel uh, for information security and operational resilience, which includes a discussion around the policies and procedures, oversight of third parties, assessing cyber risk for essential business operations, protection of client and investor information, and off-channel communications a very hot topic these days. The panelists will also highlight staff guidance, examination observations, and recent enforcement action. Uh, we have the privilege of the panel being moderated by Alexis Hall, uh, the acting national associate director for the division's examinations, technology, and control program. Alexis, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Marshall. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before we get started, let's meet the rest of the panel. I'll first turn it over to Cheryl to introduce herself. Thanks, Alexis. Uh, my name is Cheryl Zavala. I am Chief Compliance Officer and Counsel at Predium Partners. All right, next I'll turn it over to Nikolai. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Nikolai Vitashenko. I'm an Assistant Director in the uh, Division of Enforcement in the Asset Management Unit. All right, uh, next I'll turn it over to Mike. Hi, my name is Michael Khalil. I'm a senior counsel here at the Commission's Division of Investment Management. I work in the Investment Company Regulation Office and was part of the Reg SP rulemaking team. Okay, how about David? Hi, I'm uh, David Zwar. I'm a senior special counsel. I am in the uh, I'm in the chief counsel's office of the Division of Investment Management. I just want to make sure, can people hear me? 
And I've been having some slight audio issues. I just want to make sure that people can hear me. It's a little low, so if you, if you don't mind maybe speaking up a little bit, um, and I don't know where your microphone is, but if you could get a little closer, that could be helpful. Okay. And last but not least, Sal. Hi, good morning. Sal from Montemarino with the uh, Technology Controls Program with the Division of Exams. Um, nice to meet everybody this morning. Well, it's nice to have you all here. Thank you for joining us and sharing your insights on information security and operational resiliency. Uh, first, let's turn uh, to policies and procedures. David, are there any new adopted rules that will affect a firm's policies and procedures? Yeah, I think, uh, again, if, if you can't hear me, I'll try to talk <laughs> as loudly as possible. But uh, yeah, I think it's uh, to no surprise of the most of the people who are, who are hearing us. Um, there's uh, Regulation SP, which was adopted by the commission last May. Uh, the compliance dates uh, are, are, you know, we're, we're not immediate. Um, so there are there are new uh, requirements for Regulation SP. You know, Regulation SP has been in place at least it, it has been in place for quite a while since 2000. Uh, but this amendment has put uh, more leaves on the tree. Um, so the, it requires uh, it, it specifies certain information or, or certain elements that need to be included in your policies and procedures. Uh, this includes. Uh, for instance, uh, customer notification uh, is an incident response program, uh, record keeping, oversight of service providers. So there's a, there's a lot more now uh, in these amendments uh, that that provide, uh, in my view, um, a, a roadmap for compliance professionals um, to follow in connection with the regulation SP. Um, now, again, like I said, the compliance date um, I, I, is is pushed out until 2025. But that also, I just want to make sure that uh, you know Reg SP was highlighted in the uh, examination priorities uh, document that was issued recently. So that that is something um, that the, the staff, at least the examination staff, is focused on. Um, and so the implementation and also past compliance uh, with Regulation SP as well. And other than amendments to Reg SP, is there anything else concerning cybersecurity policies and procedures that you think might be helpful to the audience? Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's the uh, there's the the you know the current rules that are in place. Uh, Keith uh, Keith Cassidy mentioned a little bit earlier. There's the risk alerts that have uh, told um, you know compliance professionals sort of of, of what um, the division of examinations has been seeing out there. Um, there's, of course, uh, you know, there's Regus ID, the identity theft rule that's been in place for two th since 2013, at least the SEC uh, promulgated rule. Um, so, so we're, you know, there's Regus ID, um, and then there's also, there's been guidance that IAM has issued as well. Uh, it's a bit dated, but I think it's still relevant. Um, there's guidance on uh, Rule 38A1 and 20647. Uh, that focuses on, you know, to, to some extent on, on business continuity plans, which was also mentioned in, in the adopting release uh, in 2004 of the compliance rules. Um, and then there's also uh, a, a specific uh, a, a guidance on uh, BCP business continuity, excuse me, business continuity programs for registered investment companies or investment companies in general. So there, there's a whole uh, a sort of panoply of, of different uh, ways that the staff has addressed cybersecurity and also the way that the commission through rules has addressed cybersecurity. Okay, Sal, how does the technology controls program apply these rules to their examinations? Uh, sure, yeah, thank you, Alexis. Um, yeah, from a uh, technology controls program uh, view, uh, we do look at uh, Reg SP and we look at the protection of client data, really. We're really focusing on where and how the client data is managed within the organization. So there's not one really straightforward answer to this question. It really depends on the, say, network structure, uh, the setup of the business. Uh, on one hand, you may have a corporate office where you have all your systems residing in the office, and that's going to be one type of view. On another hand, you may be a fully remote office where everything is cloud-based services, which is a different type of review. So I'll try and speak in a more generic manner to address uh, as many aspects of, of a possible configuration as possible. Um, so when we talk about client data, we want to understand how you ingest client data, how you manage and store and utilize that data, and then of course how it may leave your organization for business purposes. Um, and so 
with that in mind, we're going to look at, just like any other exam, policies and procedures. So we're going to understand your policy, what you're trying to achieve, procedures, how are you, uh, how are you working to achieve those goals. And once we've gotten that governance structure, we look into your systems inventory. We want to understand what's your network footprint, what devices are you trying to manage, where could data potentially reside throughout your workflow, if you will, uh, and then how do you monitor that environment? What controls do you have in place and what visibility do you have into receiving data, into storing and managing that data, and then, of course, into uh, allowing that data to leave your organization? Um, and again, from the technology standpoint, we're looking at your IT operations, change management, uh, data governance. We're looking at business continuity and resilience, right? We want to understand if the service goes down, are you capable of bringing that service back up in a reasonable amount of time to not impact clients? Uh, do you have redundant capabilities? Uh, again, depending upon your business, are you leveraging mobile devices? Do you have a good mobile device management capability? Uh, and when we look at all these components, so we're, we're looking at the security controls you have in place and the kind of health and wealth monitoring you have in place. Uh, but from a security control standpoint, uh, there's you know, many different areas of security controls, but just to mention a few, we would look at endpoint security. We're going to look at your access, access control, right? How do you ensure uh, only those who require access to specific data sets have that access? How do you monitor and review those accounts? Uh, data loss prevention. We, we talk about data movement within the organization. Do you allow data to go outside your organization? And if you do, you have controls to see, uh, you know, to, to protect against certain data leaving or restrict certain data sets from leaving if that's part of your structure. Uh, of course, we'll continue and look into firewall management. Uh, we'll look into intrusion detection capabilities. Do you, can you tell if there is a breach or some sort of anomalous activity occurring within your environment. So, uh, again, I haven't hit all of the different realms, but I think that gives a good sense of what we're looking for and how we try and apply uh, regulation and speech organization. Thanks, Sal. So, mm -hmm. Cheryl, from an industry perspective and establishing policies and procedures, what are some key areas of consideration? Sure. Uh, thanks, Alexa. So, here I'd say I use a multi-step approach. Uh, understanding the regulations, mapping the requirements, partnering and communicating with internal and external persons, practicing and training. Th those are the key steps that you will hear me repeat throughout this panel. Um, I'd say first, uh, staying abreast of SEC guidance is pretty crucial. And obviously everyone who has tuned in today is on the right track. Firms should be mapping new requirements back to their existing information security controls. David and Sal just outlined the Reg SP amendments and cyber exam priorities. And I think listeners should have been asking themselves, what can we be doing now to address these items? I think regulatory mapping is also not a one and done project. Um, it needs to happen on an ongoing basis and similar mapping exercises should also be done as firms roll out new technology features. I think second, uh, important key step, uh, drafting policies. Um, obviously, it's a cross-functional exercise and multiple stakeholders at the firm need to be involved in drafting. So speak with your colleagues, including the chief technology officer, chief operating officer, other members of the legal and compliance team. Speak to them about what is being done at present and understand how they are thinking about these issues. Or at a minimum, get these issues on their radars. I think speaking with outside counsel, your network of peers is also important to benchmark best practices. Third, I think it's critical to practice implementing policies and procedures, particularly in the areas of disaster recovery, business continuity, and incident response. The first time someone reads the policy should not be when they actually need to use it. Practice is one of the best ways to identify gaps, potential improvements, and you can do this through mock, uh, mock exercises and tabletops with counsel or third party vendors. Or for certain procedures, maybe more informal discussions and run throughs are appropriate. Again, here you give the opportunity for multiple stakeholders to listen and comment. I also think it's critical for legal and compliance teams to establish themselves as true partners of the information security team. This includes regular meetings, collaboration on documentation, reporting, and testing. From my seat in a legal and compliance capacity, 
I do believe that building trust between functions pays real dividends as colleagues raise issues with me on a real-time basis. I think also many cyber failures involve some sort of human action. So employee training is imperative. There should be cyber-specific onboarding sessions to get employees acclimated to a new workplace. Based on what I've seen, new employees tend to fail phishing exams more than other, any other employee. Uh, periodic training for all employees at a regular cadence should also be held to remind the team of ongo ongoing cyber threats and new threat techniques, including social engineering, phishing, smishing. Training should be industry specific and role specific, and the completion of training should also be enforced and tracked. I do think legal and compliance teams should have input into the trainings. Uh, they should also be periodically reviewed to ensure that they're current, comprehensive, and potentially in incorporate information to address findings of cybersecurity risk assessments, which we will address shortly. I think also from a, a big picture perspective, firms cannot have a mismatch between policies and practice. It sounds pretty obvious, um, but it's not always taken into consideration. You don't want to have a policy that says X and the IT team has never implemented X or X was in implemented in an incomplete way than what the policy requires. I think consistency across policies is also important. For example, your compliance manual shouldn't say something different from your business continuity plan. I think it's also easier to ensure compliance with a process that people find realistic. So for example, if a cyber incident affects the entire firm, a foam tree call plan for employee notification is likely outdated and time consuming. Rather, it's more efficient to text or email a secondary account to communicate. Um, finally, there should also be a continual review of the policies. As mentioned on the previous director's panel, this is always going to be an iterative process. Ask yourself what needs to change, if anything, do we have ample time to implement a realistic procedure, have roles and responsibilities shifted to a different team, or do resources need to be reallocated to make the process work? Again, it's not a one and done exercise. Thanks, Cheryl, that's incredibly insightful. Uh, let's take a moment and segue to the oversight of third party vendors. Mike, can you talk a little about what the recent amendments to Reg SP say about the oversight of service providers? and the expectations for policies and procedures surrounding vendor management? Absolutely, thanks Alexis. Um, so as David mentioned earlier, covered institutions under Reg SP are required to develop incident response programs to deal with instances of unauthorized access to or use of customer information. The way the amendments deal with service providers is to require that those incident response programs establish and enforce written policies and procedures that are reasonably designed to require oversight of their service providers. This includes due diligence and monitoring and ensuring that one service providers take appropriate measures to protect against breaches of customer information. And, and then if a breach happens, uh, or if the service provider becomes aware of an instance of a relevant security breach to provide notification to the covered institution as soon as possible, but no later than 72 hours after becoming aware of the breach. Um, and then, of course, when an institution receives notice of a breach from a service provider, its own customer notification obligations kick in under Reg SP, which, which we'll talk about later. But uh, another important thing to think about is that the, the rules do allow for a covered institution to enter into a written agreement with its service provider to no so that the service provider can notify the affected individuals on the covered institution's behalf. But it's important to emphasize that the ultimate responsibility for making sure that the individuals get that notification still rests with the covered institution. Um, it's also worth emphasizing here that the rules provisions uh, regarding oversight of service providers are designed to balance sort of like, like many rules, flexibility on the one hand for the institution's relationships with its vendors. And on the other hand, with the goal of ensuring that customer protection um, and that uh, affected individuals get notification when necessary. So the release makes the point that in some cases, a covered institution might find it helpful to receive reasonable assurances from its service providers that they've taken appropriate measures. But in other cases, um, relying solely on such assurances may be insufficient. For example, if the covered institution has reason to question the representations that it gets from a particular service provider. And in those cases, 
You might consider other tools such as independent certifications or requiring attesta attestations obtained from the service provider. So those are some thoughts. Thanks, Mike. Sal, can you discuss the life cycle of vendor engagement from a cybersecurity compliance perspective and how TCP reviews the oversight of third party vendors? Uh, sure, sure. And um, you know, forgive me, I think I'm going to sound like some of my uh, lawyer colleagues. Uh, again, like in my previous discussion, it depends. It depends on the, the vendor service and the vendor function uh, that's being engaged. So I'll, I'll make two correlations. If, there, if, if a registrar is going to hire a cleaning service, uh, that cleaning service may not have as, uh, say, technical of a review uh, as a managed service provider who's going to have full access to the, the registrant's network. So, depending upon the engagement with the vendor, we're going to look at things different. Uh, and so, we'll, I'll break up the vendor management into kind of three phases. We, we look at the kind of the evaluation uh, and selection process, and then we're going to look at the continuous monitoring process, and then renewal or termination process of a given vendor. Uh, and again, we rely on policies and procedures, and in many cases, when we're talking about vendor services, we're going to ask for the contracts or agreement or engagement letters that are leveraged so that we understand explicitly what the parameters are of a given vendor engagement. Um, but so from a, a initial evaluation and selection process, we want to understand that the registrant is performing their due diligence to ensure, based on the vendor services being offered, that the vendor meets or exceeds their security controls to ensure that they don't introduce additional risk to their client data, to their systems and their environment. Um, typically, we'll look at, uh, and many vendors that offer managed service providing uh, services, uh, many vendors offer what's called a SOC 2, where they've had a third party come in and audit their environment to show that, hey, on a, re on a regular basis, we get reviewed by a third party to show that our in internal structure is secure, that we handle uh, systems, uh, you know, through industry standards. Uh, and so the SOC 2 is systems organization control. There's SOC 1 for financial, SOC 2 for more IT operations. Uh, and so theoretically we'll rely on those if it's available uh, from the vendor. However, if it's not, we do expect the registrar to have uh, a similar review and not to say that they have to leverage the SOC 2 uh, controls, but have some level of assurance that the vendor is going to, again, meet or exceed uh, their security requirements. Um, from a continuous monitoring standpoint, uh, we want to ensure that uh, the registrant has visibility and has regular updates from the vendor uh, to ensure that, well, if the vendor made a change to their environment, did that introduce additional risk? If the vendor outsourced some of its functions to a, another vendor or another contractor, now our registrant has a fourth party engagement that they may or may not be aware of. We want to ensure that they're aware of all of the different facets of that vendor's services and how they manage. Uh, and so we would expect to see regular say, touch points, regular updates, regular engagements. Uh, and also within the contract, we expect if there's any incident or outage within the vendor's services, there's a notification requirement where they would have to let the registrant know there's an issue, whether it be an IT operations outage or even a breach or something to that effect. Um, then when we come to renewal and termination, so from a renewal standpoint, similar to the uh, kind of the evaluation and onboarding process, we would expect a similar review to make sure nothing's changed from, from what they originally identified. But if there's a termination, uh, we would hope and expect that there's a contract agreement that any and all residual data, residual access to a given environment is removed and it's written that, that they will remove it and that it's, it's in the agreement. Uh, so from that perspective, and I'll give an example of say, uh, say a registrant has leveraged Microsoft Azure's cloud-based environment to store data. In the agreement, if they're going to migrate over to AWS, for example, do they have uh, assurance that Microsoft will, will absolutely wipe all of the data that exists on the Microsoft Azure environment as they've migrated their data over to AWS? So uh, those are the types of components you want to look at and see from, uh, I'd say, end-to-end -end vendor management. Thanks, Sal. So, sure, what best practices go into what you believe is establishing an effective vendor management program? Sure, I, I know I am going to echo a lot of Michael and Sal's comments, and I know I'm going to sound a little like a broken record, but I, I do think collaboration and communication with internal and external parties is imperative. So, I think first, uh, legal and compliance teams, we should be involved in the third party diligence process. 
both to plan the process and outline the questionnaire requirements and to review actual diligence materials and understand what the vendor is really doing and what the, the technology acronyms mean. Uh, I do think that firm culture should establish an expectation that this is much more than a papering exercise. Risk areas should be tested. Um, we can work alongside the information technology team to do so. So for example, if there is a third party vendor that states it has a policy that requires multi-factor authentication on all of its accounts, we should be asking, is MFA really being forced? Is it really being audited? Can we see what, what this vendor is doing? Um, I believe both uh, Michael and Sal, Sal mentioned this, a one size fits all approach to diligence doesn't work. Um, it's important to tailor the diligence process to the type of third party at issue. You would take more steps, for example, if the vendor holds sensitive firm data or PII. I think establishing cybersecurity contractual terms should also be a part of any contract negotiation process. This includes having both ideal and minimum acceptable contractual terms with some fallback options in between. You will also need personnel who are informed about the reasons for these terms and who will keep them prioritized through the negotiation process. I think it's helpful also um, for teams to prepare a checklist of key points to look out for, including any stock responses or mandatory terms that your firm will require. We should also be tracking contractual clauses that differ from our standard terms and the rationale for why. I think um, Sal also touched on this. Uh, companies should also have a built out process to respond to a range of potential third party cybersecurity incidents. Obviously, unfortunately for companies with many third party vendors, it's a matter of when an incident will occur rather than if an incident will occur. And knowing ahead of time what the risks are on an individualized vendor basis. Is it data impact? Is it operational impact? That will play a crucial role in managing an effective response. Again, you need to ask, does the vendor have sensitive firm data? Does it have PII? Are there any direct network connections with this vendor? Do they have access to our systems? If so, specifically, which ones? Um, Michael already mentioned this too, but advisors need to evaluate third party breaches for notification purposes. It's important that advisors have a mechanism for vendors to notify the company when the vendor has an incident that may compromise its data. I think this should also be part of the checklist that I mentioned. Um, I think finally, as with policies and procedures in general, it's important to have auditing and oversight to ensure that from an internal perspective, vendor management processes are being carried out appropriately and it helps us identify areas for further improvement. From an external perspective, we should audit that the third parties are still doing what they represented they were doing and period periodically assess for new cyber risks. Thanks, Cheryl. So let's now pivot towards risk assessments. Uh, so when TCP performs a review of cybersecurity risk assessments, what, what do you look at? Sure, yeah, thanks, Alexis. Um, right, with risk assessments, again, it depends. Uh, so every business has its own, uh, say, critical systems, critical business functions, depending upon the services they offer to clients. So the first thing we're going to look at is, you know, what systems are identified as critical, what business functions are identified as critical, and if there's a high, moderate low, however they, they may be categorized. Once you understand which systems are, are categorized as critical systems, we're going to try and understand how they were determined to be critical. Is it based on the business function? Was it based on uh, where the hardware sits, uh, whether it sits on the internet or internal to the corporate environment? So we want to understand the, the logic behind identifying these critical business services and functions. And then how do the uh, registrar identify the risks to those critical systems? Uh, so again, depending upon where they reside on the network, the hardware that supports these components, the software that supports these components, or these, these functions, what are the different types of risks identified? And, and, you know, just when I'm talking about risks, you know, hardware failure, so operational risks, uh, data leakage, uh, cybersecurity risks, uh, geographic risks, uh, any number of risks that could be identified uh, from all aspects of, of the environment we work in today. Um, so once we identify the risks, we want to identify 
mitigating controls for those risks, right? So, uh, you know, we've identified a, a dozen risks on a given system. Uh, we may accept a couple of those risks as, as the maybe the, the frequency or the potential for the risk to be uh, exploited is very minor. So there may be some risk acceptance, but we'd also expect to see a mitigation plan for, for the risks that are, are plausible and could potentially happen in a reasonable frequency. Uh, so we do want to see that mitigation process. Um, <clears throat> and then, the, again, the risk acceptance workflow. Uh, once that initial risk assessment has been set up and completed, we want to see continuous monitoring. So I think as Cheryl alluded to in different uh, variations for vendors and other aspects, we want to see that iterative process, right? Are you monitoring those risks? Are any changes occurring in your environment that might add to the risk that you identified originally? So it's not a set and forget. You've got to continuously monitor that environment to make sure that uh, any changes to your environment or any changes in the, you know, in just the environment as a whole in the world um, have not introduced additional risks or, or changed the risk posture uh, that you identified originally when you did this risk assessment. So uh, I'll throw in, uh, you know, artificial intelligence. I think five to, to 10 years ago, that wasn't really on the radar. We had machine learning, but I don't think large language models and all the other aspects were as prevalent as they are today. And thus many risk assessments wouldn't have identified those as risks today or as risks at that time. Today, I think 90, probably 90 percent of the risk assessments will incorporate artificial intelligence into that assessment and what pros and cons it may introduce into their environment. So uh, that would be monitoring for changes. But then the review, uh, you know, on an annual basis or whatever frequency that the registrant determines, they, would, they should go back and review their original determination to make sure they didn't miss any changes in the, in the world, any changes in their environment. So we do want to see that initial identification the continuous monitoring, and then that review. And with the review, just as I mentioned artificial intelligence, uh, if we think about, say, quantum computing, for example, we, you know, probably right now not many registrants would have that as a risk because it's not out there in the wild. It's not publicly available. It's not being used. But it is on the horizon, maybe three, five years out. So is that something that's at least being uh, review to make sure, no, this is still not a risk, it's still not out there, still not something that can, can occur. And so I just talked about AI and quantum. There's any number of new risks that could come up, and, and we want to see that the registrar is, is forward-looking, looking out into the world and seeing what new technologies and what new uh, enhancements in, on the Internet are, are occurring and making sure that does not impact their environment. Uh, and so I think that touches on the, the three aspects I would put into to our risk assessment reviews. Thanks, uh, Sal. Let's turn to Cheryl. How should a firm approach developing a risk assessment process to identify, manage, and mitigate cyber risk relevant to its particular business? What types of things should the firm consider? Uh, so the SEC and a number of regulators are setting the expectation that companies need to conduct regular cyber security risk assessments, either as a formal requirement or through guidance. So that said, I think legal and compliance teams must have a thorough understanding of what's required in a risk assessment, and they should be fully involved in the process to ensure an appropriate scope and to translate the technical findings into a narrative that non-technical stakeholders will understand. Again, you need to assemble that cross-functional internal team to ensure understanding of how the business operates what data and systems are critical and how technology supports these processes, and then to understand what the relevant risks are. I think firms can also consider a number of external sources, um, experts like cyber counsel or forensic vendors. They can provide benchmarking guidance about the risks they'd, they've identified for other similarly situated companies. Um, I think they can also describe available threat intelligence and let you see how your firm's process matches up to your peers. Um, I think also the internal working group can leverage publicly available threat intelligence and regulator and law enforcement guidance to supplement industry specific risks. Um, again, your firm um, can leverage external cybersecurity networking groups to learn what others are seeing in real time. I think to ensure an effective go forward risk assessment process, companies need to create a feedback loop that escalates identified issues. So dedicating sufficient resources like personnel and cyber tools, it's needed to address issues in a prioritized manner. Um, going back to my point 
regarding company culture. I think risk assessments will be more effective for companies that have established a culture that supports identifying and remediating cyber risks, um, where participants who are part of that group, they can they feel that they can speak honestly about areas for improvement and know that the assessment is likely to spur actual change. Um, I think finally, the, the scoping and risk identification process should account for changes to the business since the last assessment. Again, the recurring theme for uh, this panel, it, the process is iterative. Businesses could be taking in new forms of data or using new tools and certainly relevant to sales point, AR, uh, as AI features and products take off, we need to keep up with the guidance. Thanks, Cheryl. So David, is there anything else you wish to mention with respect to cyber risk or assessing cyber risk? Yeah, can people hear me? I, I heard earlier there was some, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think right now, I mean, we, you know, advisors and well, mostly advisors and obviously large fund groups, there's different risk profiles for advisors. So you have, you know, smaller advisors, it's like seeing like a, a daunting task, all of this, um, but it is, it, it is necessary. So there's, you know, I think we've been talking about a lot about leveraging communication. So a, a firm that has perhaps a lower risk profile or is a smaller, a smaller shop still needs to be able to communicate and understand uh, what their risks are to their business. So communication is actually very important. So sometimes you have a CCO and you just have perhaps an owner of the advisor. Nevertheless, that, that CCO, um, you know, suggests that they understand the risks that are specific to their business and to their clients. So the risk with respect to their client information, the risk with respect to the systems they operate. Uh, so they, they need to have some type of dialogue, whether it's a third party uh, or the actual vendors, so they get a better understanding and can better implement uh, what they determine to be better policies and procedures, and also be able to implement those policies and procedures. So these these policies and you know these rules are actually crafted in a way that should be able should, are, are applicable actually to large shops, mid-level shops, and smaller shops. And that we do understand at least in I am that you know it's, it's daunting for smaller shops, but it is possible. And communication is a very important component. Of, of all of this. Thank you. So let's turn to the protection of investor information. Mike, as discussed, the commission adopted amendments to Regulation SP. How should firms prepare as we approach the rules compliance dates? Oh, absolutely. So I think one thing that might be useful for firms to get their hands around um, is understanding the difference between customer information and sensitive customer information under the rules. Um, and figuring out things like where your systems might have those different kinds of information, who has access to it, you know, sort of uh, reiterating the points about mapping that, that were made earlier. So, as we mentioned earlier, the amendments require an incident response program, which must be reasonably designed to detect, respond to, and recover from unauthorized access to or use of customer information. So, customer information under the rules is a broad term, which for most covered institutions is any record containing non-public personal information about a customer of the financial institution that is in the institution's possession or that is handled or maintained by the institution or on, on its behalf. So again, it's a pretty wide scope. And the response program must include procedures for covered institutions to assess the nature and scope of any incident and take appropriate steps to contain and control the incident to pre prevent further unauthorized access or use. So it's customer information, broad responsibilities. Then the response program also includes a requirement that covered institutions provide notification to individuals whose sensitive customer information was or is reasonably likely to have been accessed or used without authorization. Sensitive customer information is a subset of customer information that either alone or in conjunction with other information could create a reasonably likely risk of substantial harm or inconvenience to an individual identified with the information if it were compromised. So. What does that mean? Some specific examples of sensitive customer information include, you know, think social security number, any information that's uniquely identified with an individual that's reasonably likely to be used as a means of authenticating their identity. Now, it could also be information that could identify an individual or an individual's account number, such as a username, 
that in combined with other other information that could be used to gain access to the customer's account, such as a security code or a credit card expiration date. So I think getting a handle around, you know, where is that information? What what might be you know uh, at risk and what sort of obligations accompany it would be important. Firms should also be familiarizing themselves with the content and timing requirements for customer notification. So under the final amendments, a customer notice must be clear, must be conspicuous, and must be provided by a means designed to ensure that each affected individual can reasonably be ex expected to receive it. And because it's not always easy to ascertain the extent and scope of a cyber incident, the rule basically provides a rebuttable presumption that notice is required and it does so by saying that notice must be provided as soon as reasonably practicable, but no later than 30 days after the covered institution becomes aware that unauthorized access to or use of the customer information has or is reasonably likely to have occurred. So if you're unsure, there's a presumption that notice needs to be required, needs to be provided. However, notice will not be required if the covered institution determines after a reasonable investigation of the facts and circumstances that sensitive customer information has not been and is not reasonably likely to be used in a manner that would result in substantial harm or inconvenience now, of course that would have to be that reasonable investigation would have to be done within the 30-day time frame but these provisions are supposed to work together to avoid the cost and anxiety of unnecessary notifications where it's clear that there's no harm um, but to otherwise ensure that where there's a risk of harm, customers have the information necessary to make their own determinations about what steps they need to take. Um, and it's important to emphasize here that where an investigation's results are inconclusive, the covered institution is required to provide notification. Um, and then I'll just close by reminding folks that there's tiered com a tiered compliance period for here uh, for this rule. Uh, smaller entities have a little more time, so larger entities must comply by December of 2025. I think David mentioned that, and then uh, smaller entities have until June 2026. Thank you, Mike. So Mike talked a little bit about um, what's coming as far as uh, the new Reg SP is concerned. Uh, but Nikolai, are there any common themes or patterns among enforcement actions um, involving uh, what's currently uh, Reg SP? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So th th there hasn't been, I would say, a huge amount of enforcement activity on um, with respect to regulation SP, but there there have been a few cases brought over the years. Uh, the last of which were, were brought around 2021, and I'll cover some learnings from those shortly. But before I do, what I what I do want to recommend to people who are interested in sort of the latest trends and what what's what people are seeing is is the multiple uh, division of exams risk alerts that have been published on this topic, including one from last year and, and some before that. The risk alerts often <clears throat> reflect what, what examiners are, are seeing on a, on a day to day basis at firms. So I think that's, that's a good source of um, learning and, and seeing what, what the common issues are um, that arise in connection with, with Reg SP and the, and the safeguards rule. Uh, so I mentioned, um, the, the, the last set of cases from 2021. Um, so, so at that time, we announced um, three actions simultaneously, all against registered investment advisors. Um, in, in all three cases, um, email accounts of firm personnel were taken over by unauthorized parties. Um, and according to the orders, these breaches uh, compromised or potentially compromised the personally identifiable information of thousands of firm clients. These orders found that the investment advisors had did have cybersecurity policies and procedures to some extent, but they failed to design and implement them in a manner that would be that was sufficient to protect email accounts in particular. So um, there there are multiple examples in the orders of kind of the, the shortcomings, but I'll, I'll mention a couple. So for example, one of the firms. One of the firms had policies that required use of multi factor authentication, but multi factor authentication wasn't activated for some of its personnel accounts um, that had access to personally identifiable information. Um, another firm, actually, I think all the firms also failed to adopt policies and procedures and security measures um, with respect to independent contractors who had access to sensitive information. 
Um, so just just a big gap there in terms of um, who was covered by um, the firm policies and procedures. Uh, all of the firms were were, were charged with um, violations of Rule 38, 30A of Regulation SP. Uh, one advisor also sent um, misleading breach notifications to its clients. Um, that was in violation of, of um, Rule 206. Uh, 206 uh, two. Um, so the, the firms, um, each of the firms paid penalties in the amount of 200,000 to 300,000 in that range. And I think, um, you know, the, 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 there are a number of takeaways from, from these actions, um, even, even though they are kind of pre amendment um, actions here, but, um, you know, in, in this kind of picks up on what, what a lot of the panelists have been saying this morning, but it, it is not sufficient to have cybersecurity's policies and procedures just to have the policies and procedures. The requirements and, and those policies have to be complete and tailored to the business and the requirements in those policies have to be fully implemented. Um, and that's especially true in the face of known attacks that, that have occurred and w which was the case for, for all of these firms in these matters. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, Cheryl, gatekeepers play a vital role in protecting investors. What role do they play in ensuring IT assets containing customers' PII are properly disposed of? Sure. Um, so here I interpreted gatekeepers to mean third-party vendors like law firms, fund administrators, or accounting firms who hold PII and other sensitive firm data um, and who play a pretty critical role in protecting and disposing of such data. I, I do think these principles um, do apply to registrants as well. So uh, like us registrants, um, these gatekeepers, we're, we're still learning how to practice proper data hygiene, even for PII. I think it is still too common of a practice for third parties and registrants to retain huge amounts of historical data. Um, this obviously carries significant cybersecurity, privacy, and operational risk if retention is no longer necessary for business operations or for other legitimate purposes. Um, I do think there is an increasing body of regulations like Reg SP and other federal and state laws that focus on whether registrants are retaining data reasonably and for legitimate purposes. So when we do vet these third party gatekeepers, um, we do need to ensure that they have retention and disposal requirements that comply with the relevant rules. And to everyone's point, we need to test that they are implemented. Um, I understand this can be a huge time commitment um, and resource commitment for both registrants as well as for gatekeepers themselves, but this is something that we should be focusing on. Um, I think both sides also need to create realistic policies and procedures that can be carried out and equip personnel with ample training. There should be checks on compliance, um, for example, through certifications from gatekeepers. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's pretty important to have an effective partnership between information security and the legal and compliance functions, both within your firm and at the gatekeepers. I think with data minimization and disposal, everybody needs to be aligned on what the data is, where is it stored, who's responsible for deleting it and wiping systems and how data will permanently be deleted. Um, I think finally, disposal is an area where legal and compliance can make improvements to the contracts. Again, back to the contracts uh, to ensure that data no longer needed is properly disposed of. And we should then track when our relationships with third parties wind down so we can prepare and understand how to either retrieve or receive confirmation that the data was properly disposed of. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to our, our last topic, which is off-channel communications. And from the view of enforcement staff, um, does staff consider off-channel communications strict liability violations? So for example, would a single rogue employee engaged in off-channel communications cause a violation? Thanks. Uh, so th there's there's a legal kind of strict legal answer to, to this question, but um, w which I'll cover. But I think it's it's it, it more important to focus on the context in which 
we've brought the off channel cases so far, um, which I think is is probably more more important and more helpful in kind of understanding how we look at um, enforcement in this in this space. So, like from a legal perspective, you know, these are fairly black and white rules, and um, there's not a minimum number of communications that would <clears throat> that would constitute a violation. There's not a, a mental state requirement, so it's it's a it's a pretty pretty black and white rule. Um, but in terms of kind of the, the practical aspect of this and what we take into account, really anytime we consider to recommending a case, um, including in the off channel communications area, um, you know, in, in every order that, um, in every case that we've brought so far, all the orders have found widespread failures to follow the record keeping rules and widespread failures to follow the firm's own policies and procedures. And those failures were occurring at all levels of the organization. Um, so the violations in in the cases we have brought have been pervasive. Um, so we we have not, you know, that that's that's a key difference. And you know, we have not brought the cases where there there's one rogue employee. All of these are addressing an industry wide problem in um, in the context of of a, of a sweep. And so I think um, once once we get kind of past um, past this past this this bringing cases in the context of a sweep, I think we will we will consider uh, those types of violations um, sort of on a, on a one off basis, and um, we'll we'll take into account just as we do in, in every case the what the nature of the violation is, the scope, and a whole other a whole host of other factors in in terms of whether to recommend a case. And, and how can firms that have off-channel communication issues benefit from cooperating with commission staff? That's, that's a great question. And I wanna be clear that firms absolutely can benefit from cooperating with the commission staff and they have benefited. Firms that self-report, self-police, cooperate and remediate do get credit. That's true in the off-channel communication space and that's also true across all of our cases. So th there, I'll focus on the off-channel cases, but th there have been many cases, including um, where, where firms have self-reported and they um, they received either a uh, resolution where there were no penalties or greatly reduced panel penalties. So some recent examples of this include the Adam Investors case and the Catalyst case. Those were both investment advisors who self-reported their off-channel issues and they, um, they had resolutions that involved no penalties. Uh, there are also two uh, recent broker dealer cases, Canaccord and Regions, where the penalties for those firms who, who cooperated and self-reported were um, significantly lower than um, they would have been or that they were would have been otherwise. Uh, so these outcomes and, and many others should encourage firms to self-police, self-report, and remediate and to meaningfully cooperate with the division in, in our investigations. That's really good to know. So, Cheryl, from an industry perspective, what are some best practices for addressing off-channel communications? Sure. I, I mean, I should start out with the preface, the SEC sweep into off-channel communications at broker-dealers and RIAs started three years ago. So we should have a very clear understanding of what the commission's expectations are. Um, it, it's pretty clear, and to Nikolai's point, it's pretty black and white. Um, the commission is, I would say, at a zero tolerance uh, for off-channel communications, and our firm policies need to expressly prohibit such communications. Um, some firms have narrow carve-outs for purely logistical or administrative messages, but I think those exemptions need to be really tightly defined and revisited as mobile messages can, can easily cross the line from purely logistical to substantive. Uh, we know texting is widespread. It's an everyday form of communication. So firms have to be practical. Um, it's not enough to just ban texting in policy because then it will just continue to happen off channel. Uh, I think firms really need to be proactively providing some sort of a platform for compliant texting. Um, either an approved mobile messaging platform for a bring your own device program or providing a second phone that is controlled by your firm. Um, 
we also need to be able to socialize these policies through regular trainings and certification with employees. Um, firms also have to enforce policies and procedures by imposing actual consequences for violations. So I think it's important to have a, a disciplinary framework for violations um, and escalating discipline for repeat violations. I think firms also need a process for repatriating off-channel communications back to firm systems once they are discovered. So for example, um, an employee who sent um, a text regarding a substantive matter should be encouraged to self-report and send a screenshot of the off-channel text to the legal and compliance team. Um, finally, I think firms need to surveil for off-channel communications. That means surveilling email to determine whether there are references to off-channel communications. Obviously, it's the compliance officer's gut feeling um, oftentimes. Um, we also need to surveil approved text, messages, text messaging platforms um, just as we would surveil emails. And what practices can small firms put into place? Sure. I, I mean, like Nicola said, th this is a pretty black and white rule. Um, the commission expects firms of all sizes to follow this framework. So there aren't exceptions or real modifications uh, for smaller firms. Um, books and records are books and records, um, regardless of firm size. I think it would. It, it's obvious that smaller firms may find it cross, cost prohibitive to issue two phones. So they should consider a separate mobile messaging platform for employees' personal devices. Um, it's likely going to be more affordable, but it's something that needs to be addressed. Great, thank you. And while we're on the topic of off-channel communications, I thought I'd throw in a question um, we received from the audience. Uh, so this question asks to define what communications need to be archived and reviewed. So would that include messages that trigger an actionable item or any business communication, whether it be internal or external? I, I can try to, to answer that um, to, to some extent, at least. So the, the, the message, the, what falls within the record keeping provisions is, is covered by primarily for investment advisors under rule 204, 2A of the advisors act and rule 17, a for B4 under the Exchange Act. And those are the two provisions under which um, we've we've brought cases um, in, in this in this latest sweep. Uh, and so generally speaking, um, Rule 17 A4 B4 addresses um, communications relating to the broker dealer business as such. Um, that's a pretty both of these rules are pretty broad. Um, so you know, many, 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 if not all or most substantive communications will will fall into into that rule. And then um rule two or rule two or four um dash two a um covers likewise covers a wide variety of communications, including communications regarding recommendations, investment recommendations that were either made or proposed, uh delivery or receipt of funds and securities execution of um, any order or um, in the performance of um, accounts or client accounts or, or funds, et cetera. And that's, that's very much a non exclusive list, but th those are, um, those are the record keeping provisions um, sort of applicable and, and which have been cited in the, in the orders we've brought so far. Thank you. So. Anyone want to have anything else to add to that? Okay, well, it seems um, that we have a little bit of extra time left, so I will throw out a few other questions we received from the audience. Um, so this one's related to the oversight of third party vendors. Are there different expectations for due diligence, depending how much client information they have access to? And so I think you might have touched upon this a little bit earlier. Um, right, yeah, I, I utilize the, the kind of the cleaning services versus the managed service provider aspect. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it the, depending upon the vendor services, depending upon the, the access they have to the network environment, to client data or sensitive business data, um, or whether it be access to or hosting, uh, yes, we would expect more due diligence than a, you know, a one-off, you know, maybe, maybe it's a paper shredder or a, a shredding company as well. You're not going to necessarily do 
uh, as much due diligence on that vendor other than ensuring that they have the proper physical security controls and the proper shredding functionality. So yes, it, it, I'd say absolutely depending upon the services and functions offered by the vendor. And I'll, and I'll add one more question uh, regarding Reg SP. Um, does it require client notification of third party vendor security breach? Any thoughts on that? So I'll, I'll take a, a swing at that. Um, so the answer is yes. If, if the breach involves uh, uh, sensitive customer information, of one of your customers, and that sensitive customer information was or reasonably likely to have been accessed or used without authorization. So, you know, the, it's the same as, as I made the point earlier. Ultimately, the the, the requirement and the obligation to notify rests with the covered institution. So, you have to go through the same calculus um, and analysis. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Tom. just. Yeah, just to echo what Michael's saying is, is you know, I, I use the, the terminology that you can definitely outsource the services and functions uh, to vendors, but you're not outsourcing the responsibility. So as a registrar, you are responsible for any and all uh, impact to client data that you're leveraging. Well, thank you. And thank you all. That actually takes us to the end of our panel. I thank you all for your valuable insight and I thank the audience for joining us. And with that, I will pass it over to Vanessa. Thank you so much, Alexis. I uh, appreciate uh, you leading the discussion on such a valuable, valuable uh, and uh, important topics that are facing us today. And thank you to all the panelists. I am going to um, give us a, a little break uh, before our next panel. Uh, to correct any technical difficulties, difficulties we might be experiencing on the public facing website, sec.gov, and we will get back on track and back to our panels, which the next one will be our registered investment company topics at 1053 Eastern. Okay, so we'll go to break. Thank you so much. <laughs> 